We Brits are a nation of obsessive collectors. Across the country, there are storage units straining at the seams, wow. <laughs> groaning garages, and stuffed garden sheds. Wow, oh I've God. forgotten how much stuff I've had. Home to dreams. It's my director's chair. Past lives. That's unbelievable. And untold baggage. And we're drowning in it. For heaven's sake, what are all these things? But among the clutter and the junk... Empty box! <laughs> my mission is to find buried treasure. 1,500 to 2,500 pounds there. Wow. Gosh. Yeah. Unlock memories. There's a lot of memories in two boxes. And turn trash into cash. 260, 270, 280. Welcome to the world of storage hoarders. Today, our first long-term collector is World War II veteran Frank Bond. Over the last 27 years, he's run up a staggering storage bill of nearly £50,000. Worried daughter Victoria and the rest of his family think it's time to stop. Frank? They've always been on to me to do something about it, basically not because they want anything, it's actually to relieve the pressure on me paying all this money. Frank now lives in Eltham on the outskirts of London, birthplace of legendary wartime entertainer Bob Hope. For 90-year-old Frank, time is now of the essence for dealing with his collection. As I'm not getting any younger, one of the things that's worried me is that if suddenly I disappear, they're left with a, a bill. And I don't want that to happen at all. But the seeds of his horrendous hoarding problem were sown 40 years ago and thousands of miles away. Frank and his family moved to Hong Kong in 1974. For Frank's wife Eileen, it was an opportunity to fill their palatial apartment with mementos of their time in the Far East. She had uh, an eye for uh, curiosities, uh, things which she said were valuable if we collected. When the time came to return to England, so too did the products of 14 years of bargain hunting, collecting and hoarding. When the Chinese packers came in, if you hadn't said, pack that or don't pack that, they automatically packed it. And that's why there's so much. And you had to watch yourself, otherwise if you sat down too long, you'd be packed as well. Unable to find room back in England, it all went straight from ship to storage, just a stopgap, or so daughter Victoria thought. My parents assured me, said, don't worry, you'll see everything in three months' time. So, you know, 27 years down the line. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Sadly, Eileen passed away, leaving a big hole in Frank's life and a storage unit filled with memories he couldn't bring himself to deal with. But for Frank's daughter, now is the time to sort out his 27-year-old storage problem. The thought of tackling something like that is probably what's put us off for this long. Because where do you start? Where do you start with something like that? It's just, you know, I can't, it's hard to get your head around it, never mind physically to go there and sort it all out. Well, after 27 years in storage, who knows what treasures we'll uncover? Maybe some memorabilia from Frank's heroic World War II past as a naval officer. Frank took part in the daring naval Arctic convoys delivering supplies to Russia, sailing through the frozen Northern Ocean filled with enemy U-boats. This has given him some ideas on how to spend any money he makes. Probably to go back to Russia because I have an affinity with the Russian people. Can I persuade this wartime veteran that it's never too late to do battle with his hoarding habit? Well, after all these years, it's now time for Frank and Victoria to open up their storage time capsule. Hello, Frank. Hello. Lovely How to are meet you? you. So, we're going to start this problem today, aren't we? We are. Are you looking forward to it? Well, I am because I can't remember what I packed in there. I'm not surprised. 27 years is a long time. So, I'm going to call in my muscle men now to open up. Guys, you ready? Here we are. That's the right. moment of discovery. <laughs> wow. Oh, right, loads and loads of boxes. Everything's concealed can't inside. Believe it, can't believe it. Should we get in and have a look? Yes, yes I think so, yes. Well, well we don't, no, I don't want it at all. 
This is very heavy. Careful. I'm so excited about this. I don't know what it is. It's certainly beautifully packed. It's a bit like Christmas Day with all this wrapping paper. Frank's down to have a look in here. More packing. <laughs> And it's bringing back childhood memories for Victoria, though not everything has got such sentimental value. <laughs> it <doesn't> even... <laughs> <What's this? laughs> wow! There's so much stuff stored away, I'm already beginning to wonder if they're ever going to get through it. Our next serial collector is private investigator Daniel Gibbon. His hoard has cost him more than £1,300 over the past year. It's time to get shot of his storage, and his mate Alistair is here to help. But first, I need to find out how this hoarding habit began. I was offered a, a great quantity of pictures, and I thought they were a bit of a bargain, um, and I needed someone to stash them. Daniel lives in Birmingham, cradle of the Industrial Revolution, but not normally noted for its art scene. However, a year ago, Daniel decided to branch out into art dealing. He spent a total of £3,000 on a collection of 1,000 art prints. However, there was one problem. Daniel doesn't know anything about art. They seemed like a good idea at the time, and then afterwards, what do you do with them now? Unable to make a quick profit, off to storage it all went. Where it has stayed for the past year? What does Daniel's wife think? I think the, the expression, one was not amused, uh, would, would probably nicely uh, encapsulate her view in, in a polite sense um, of the, the things I sometimes buy and bring home, uh, much to her non-amusement. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time I've bought lots of random things. I think the last time was 500 sledges, which seemed like a good idea, and I've still got some in the shed, if you want one. <laughs> Daniel's young son, Ben, means he's got a whole new set of priorities in the frame. I'd like to be saving that, 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 that money each month that I'm spending uh, and really putting it towards uh, ben, Ben's education in the future. Only a select few, like his mate Alistair, have been allowed a private view. He opened the doors to this storage unit and I was just really taken back by uh, the uh, sheer number of pictures that were in there and some of them are very, very massive as well. Alistair's got his own idea on how to get rid. Burn them? <laughs> it's an option, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. £3,000 worth of kindling. Mm. <laughs> well, that's a bit mean, Alistair. Daniel may surprise you. Who knows, there could be a Picasso hidden in that lot. Can I get Daniel to see the bigger picture and hang up his storage habits for good? It's time for Daniel's private gallery to get its first viewing for over a year. Oh, my word. I don't think the wife would be too happy if I took them all home and put them up on the wall. I think these two amateur art critics need my help if they're to brush up on their minimalist techniques. I'm going in. So, I hear that we've got quite a few prints to look we've at. We've got loads Lots and we? loads. Of tons. Well, have a look. We're going to keep you busy for days. Oh, my goodness. How much are you hoping to make from these, um, do you think? If you could double my money... Double? I'd take you out for a curry. <laughs> I'd take you out for a curry. Well, may, may, a... Maybe a glass of wine. We might stretch this. So, hold on. <laughs> when you say double your money, do you mean double the money you spent on storage? I'm, I'm or looking double... at 6,000 would be lovely. Are you serious? You think that you can get six thousand pounds for this one? You'd lot? like a ch you'd like a challenge. <laughs> six thousand pounds. Well, I like a bit of ambition, but there's so many in here. He'll have to get cracking. So there could be some treasures. There could be some good ones. I think there are some nice ones. There are some there which are sort of you know a really good quality. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they'll adorn somebody's wall. Excellent. So we want value nice in there, there, don't we? We've got some value in there, I reckon. You reckon? OK. Well, need to get everything out. You feeling strong? Yeah, we are. You, Alistair? Very strong. Excellent. <laughs> well, on you go, everything out, okay. and I'll catch up with you later. No okay. problems. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Right then, mate. Yep. Let's get a shift on. I want them to unpack all of Daniel's secret gallery so they can have a proper look. With over a 1,000 pictures to sort through, they've got their work cut out. Coming up, Frank's unpacking the past. 
a wedding basket. So what's the idea behind the well, wedding basket? Well, the Chinese basket? used to put all their stuff in there. Daniel's art hall gets some tough reviews. Which thinks skip. Skip that, definitely, definitely. And will our hopeful hoarders bid farewell to any hidden treasures at auction? <laughs> Welcome back to Storage Hoarders. Earlier, we met Frank and his daughter, Victoria. Over the past 27 years, Frank has spent nearly £50,000 storing all the belongings the family brought home after spending 14 years in Hong Kong. Do you think we could put this real plastic bowl to charity? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> or in the skip. <laughs> and Daniel, aided by his friend Alistair, whose adventures in the art world have left him with his own private gallery of a thousand prints. They've been gathering dust and costing him over £1,300 a year to store. Go on, grab that one, Mike. Wow, I like this one. I've seen this in a few pubs. To help them come to terms with their collections, I want them to split their possessions into categories. Keep it for those really sentimental items, skip it for anything old, broken or just plain awful, or sell it for the items they think could be of value. I've also added a charity area where they can put anything that's too good to chuck. Later, I'll be asking our antiques expert, Tom Keane, to help our hoarders sort through their unwanted items to see if there's anything of value to take to auction. After 27 years, Frank is wasting no time. This Chinese wood is quite good, isn't it? <laughs> it might be here in another 25 years. That's right. <laughs> they were worth their fee in packing, weren't they? Now that everything's out of the units, it's a chance to see exactly what they've got. Daniel and Alistair may only have one kind of item, there just happens to be a thousand of them. Well, thanks to that meticulous Chinese packing company, Frank and Victoria have a neat and orderly pile. Only problem is, it's still growing. There is so much stuff here. We've just opened up a 27-year-old time capsule. It may have taken Frank 27 years, but now he's a man on a mission. Sail. Sail, straight away. Lift it up and it goes in for sail anyway. It's all hands on deck as the retired naval officer takes the wheel. Carpets and rugs, they're, they're for sale. OK. okay. <laughs> There's no one rolled up in here. <laughs> Frank's plotting a steady course, but some mementos of his time in Hong Kong might be harder to throw overboard. This is the first time Frank has revisited his life in Hong Kong since his wife Eileen passed away. The wedding basket. So what's the idea behind the well, wedding basket? Well, the Chinese basket? used to put all their stuff in there. Oh. And they're all levels, you see. But fortunately, Victoria is on board to make the tough calls for him. Victoria's got to decide what to do with this. That, in fact, that was the one piece that I was looking out for that I did want to keep. It's great so much as going for sale, but I'm glad to see Victoria hanging on to a few items by which to remember her mum. Anyway, I'm a bit too old to get married with a wedding bar. You never know, it's never too late. <laughs> there are some real beauties in Frank's hoard. Very, very good. Yes, it's excellent. Amazing. Yeah. For sale. <laughs> Though some stuff is more Chinese throwaway than takeaway. Um, explain, please. Explain. 27 years. Well, the, the grapes point have been is, in storage. I think actually <laughs> they were purely for decoration. The dining room table. Yeah. Mm, very grand. No bananas or anything like that. <laughs> Quarter century old plastic grapes. That'll be joining the vintage toothpaste, I feel. But not all of Frank's items are quite oh. so recognisable. What on earth is this? Have you got any idea what this is? Ah, now I think I know what this is. This would be a pillow. Um, in a the pillow? Yes, in fact, in the old days when the Chinese ladies didn't want to ruin their fantastic hairdos, they would uh, sleep one of those and keep the head very still. <laughs> so, yeah, so it may not be comfortable, here. I think. But it's, uh, it's rock hard. Yeah, it goes underneath the neck. Yeah. How amazing. Mm. What an intriguing item. I think it's worth finding out a bit more about it. So I've sent Frank and Victoria off to see Chinese and Asian antiques expert Justin Fryer at his shop in West London. So, Victoria, what do you have to show me? All right, well, I've actually got a... Um, I think it's a Chinese pillowcase. You can hopefully tell me more about it. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it's, it's a red lacquered Chinese 
um, pillow. Um, it's a more modern copy of something they would have had in the 19th century, certainly. Mm -hmm. The Chinese believe that soft pillows stole energy while you sleep. For over 1,000 years, they made them from wood, bronze, bamboo, even porcelain. They also like to decorate their pillows, and today, some are sought after by collectors. In 2012, an ornamental Chinese pillow sold at Sotheby's for over £120,000. So, is it sweet dreams for Frank, or will he be crying into his pillow? There are people that collect them, and there are a lot of different designs. Obviously, the people that collect the antique ones yeah. in, in particular. Yeah. But there's a lot of this lacquered or heavily lacquered um, Chinese artefacts coming yeah. out. Not the most comfortable things, in my opinion. Have you ever tried it? <laughs> no, not not on your <laughs> life. I wouldn't get near the thing. Are they very valuable or...? No, unfortunately, I mean, if it had been an antique piece, um, sometimes you had them that were leather-clad as well, yeah. they, they would be sort of valuable. Um, currently, I mean, these you can actually go onto the internet and buy for about £30, £35. Um, if I was to purchase this and obviously allow us some chance of making a profit, as a decorative item, I would be w willing to offer £15. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Or would you like to well, keep this and use it, perhaps? I moment? can't <laughs> use it, because I've been sworn by my GP not to use wooden pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Deal done, and now Frank should be able to sleep comfortably. Delighted. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Victoria is. Yep. She, she's holding the money. Well, it's, and it's one less item to uh, hold on to. <laughs> Daniel and Alistair are still coming to terms with the sheer size of Daniel's hoard. There's a lot here, isn't there? Let's have a little think about right. what we're going to do with these. He's got everything from modern photos to old masters. Reproductions of vintage hand-painted and printed advertising posters are currently very popular and the originals sell for many hundreds of pounds. A collection of vintage London Underground advertising posters recently sold for half a million pounds at auction. I might <laughs> keep that for my little boy, actually. He can have that for his, for his room. Keep a far keep London. Daniel can't afford to dilly-dally, but Alistair's hoping to save at least one print for himself. Mate, can you give us this one? This is the one you want to keep for me. You want that one? Yeah, well, I like this. Yeah? You can have that as your workers' bonus, provided keep... you do more than your, your normal three hours a day. <laughs> All right, <laughs> yeah. you can have that. Is this your keep pile down here, is it? Three keepers so far. That's not going to make his pile of prints any more palatable. I think Daniel's son, Ben, might be better served by his dad turning some of his prints into profits. Time for me to sketch out a plan. Hi, Daniel, how's it going? Not oh, my too goodness. Bad. Seems like an awful lot here, doesn't there? There is quite a lot, and I think um, we're only just starting it. Are you feeling a bit overwhelmed, or...? Um, I'll tell you in a couple of hours <laughs> how I feel. I think that's <laughs> going to be the, the important thing. The separate piles are slowly building, but Daniel needs a quick lesson in the fine art of letting so, go. Notre Dame, is it? We'll keep that. Keep I it? Think. OK. Yeah. Now, hold on a sec, Daniel. When you say keep it, what are you going to do with oh. it? See, I quite like that one. Yeah, but hold on. Do you quite like it or do you love it and no, have to have it? No, let's sell it. Sell it. Yeah. In the words I of agree. that singer, it's all about the money. I think Daniel's getting the hang of this now. He's starting to make an impression on his impressionists and isn't being distracted by the abstracts. I don't like these charity shop. Yeah. What do you think? Skip? Skip that, definitely. Definitely, yeah. But it's not all quite to my taste. It's got the word skip written all over it. You've got to agree. Go on, then. Before my mother sees it. <laughs> well, they can't all be works of art, can they? The clock is running down for Frank and Daniel, so with the pressure on, there's just enough time for one final push. So, anyway, horse, yeah, somebody likes horses. horses. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good sell. A chance for Frank and Victoria to make those really tough decisions. If you can't remember what it was for, then I think that can be junks. Sale. Charity shop or skip. Oh, who knows?
Stepping back 27 years in time is hard, but it's been a chance to unpack some remembrances of Frank's wife, Eileen. All this going through all your stuff, is it bringing back loads of memories? Yes. Good memories. Oh, yes. Spending money. <laughs> And the good saying, old days. I'm saying, we don't need that. So your wife was a real magpie, was she? Oh, yes, was Yeah, she? well, Dad made the money and Mum spent <laughs> it. <laughs> Finally, both pairs have managed to sort their items into keep, skip and sell piles. Yes. Good man, well done. <laughs> As predicted, Daniel has a substantial sell pile. Well, there's not much in Frank and Victoria's keep pile, but Skip, Charity and Cell look pretty healthy. It's only taken 27 years to get there. Next, I want our antiques expert to see if there's any hidden treasures buried among them. Coming up, Frank puts his cards on the table. Are you interested in buying it? And will their Hong Kong hoard turn out to be just Hong Kong fooey? All right, let's start at £10 and see where it goes. Don't listen to this. Welcome back to Storage Hoarders. Earlier, we met Daniel and his mate Alistair, who've been sorting through Daniel's hoard of a thousand prints, which cost him three thousand pounds and are now being stored to the tune of thirteen hundred pounds a year. While Frank and his daughter Victoria have been coming to terms with their twenty-seven-year-old time capsule, I've asked antiques expert Tom Keane to take a look at their Hong Kong hoard. With 20 years' experience in the collectibles trade, Tom is a practised hand at sorting the trash from the treasure. So, Tom, you've had a good roam round Frank and Victoria's time capsule. What do you think? Well, when I first heard the time capsule up here, I got quite excited. Aggie, yeah. this is a Moorish or oh, yes. North African-inspired yes. lantern. Yeah. How do I know it's reproduction? It's very light. Correct. Oh! Very oh, light. It's almost, feather light. Almost blow away, wouldn't it? It's now, amazingly light. An original will weigh three times that. Now you've got a little spice box. Oh, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. 12th, 13th century style, these spice boxes, but uh, it's a tourist piece again. <laughs> the better news is the sideboard. Mm -hmm. Ah. They're quite a nice size, nice condition. If you're lucky, £150, but if I put it to auction, I'll put 80 to 120 on it, and hopefully two people will like it. Mm. Now you've got a screen over there. Screen printed almost 10 or 15 pounds always worth. The china on the table, if you've got 40 or 50 pounds, the whole lot on that table, take the money. Well, what can you tell me about the table at the front? It's for cooking and all holding food, and underneath you put your feet underneath, and the heating goes down, and if you're cold, it makes your feet warm. Worth 50 to 100 pounds. A nest of three tables there. Oh, yes. They're um, obviously Chinese influence, yeah. worth about 40 or 50 pounds for a set of three. Yeah. My favourite piece um, is a set of library steps here. They're still very useful, still very popular. Oh, is that what it is? Yes, look. Right. Handle to grab hold of, up you go. Oh, I wondered what they were. Yeah. Yeah. Up to the top book, and down you get. Uh, made in, um, what's the word, teak, and um, in the Victorian style, so taken from an English model, and uh, you see that, can you imagine in a chemist shop? Yeah, yeah. old chemist yeah, yeah, shops. Absolutely. That's what they're used for. Yes. You might, I'll, I'll put an estimate of 80 to 120 on those. Again, you might get 150 if you're lucky. They're still very useful sure. and very popular, oh, right. and the condition is good. Yeah. Mm. So, what are you thinking about all this that Tom's I think it's very good. Mm -hmm. If I can sell it, no matter what, mm -hmm. I'd sell it. Mm -hmm. Because it's been hanging about for yes. a long time, mm -hmm. costing me a lot of money to exactly. rent. If other people get some pleasure from it, hooray! Mm -hmm. Frank's Hong Kong hoard has provided some interesting items for Tom to select for auction, including the Ming style sideboard at 80 to 100 pounds, the screen at 10 to 15 pounds, and the selection of china at 40 to 50 pounds. Also going to auction is the hibachi coffee table with an estimate of 50 to 100 pounds, the Chinese style nest of tables valued at 40 to 50 pounds, and the library steps at 80 to 120 pounds. Tom has identified most of the items which should go to general auction, but there's an interesting table he wants to check out first with expert Hubert Phipps, who's been dealing in antiques in West London for 15 years. The table was bought by Frank Stad in the 30s, shipped to Hong Kong, then shipped back and left in storage for, yes, that's right, 27 years. 
Hubert, thanks for letting us come along. This is Frank and Victoria. This is their lovely, lovely table. Well, it might not be so lovely. Have a look at yourself, and what do you think of it? Well, I mean, the first thing's Frank, thank you very much for bringing the table in. It's a nice um, table. I'm afraid to say it's not actually period. I mean, it's actually a, a reproduction one. Definitely William and Mary sort of style. cross frame stretchers, yeah. cabriole leg, got the quarter veneering walnut on top. Yeah. So, and it's got that very much Dutch influence on the cross stretch, oh, I, I believe. Yeah. And this is where yeah. you can see with the style. You can yeah. always yeah, know yeah. styles mm -hmm. of furniture, but the halving is actually trying to get the period ones. That's right. The William and Mary style dates from the late 17th and early 18th century, when William II and his wife Queen Mary II were on the throne. If it were an American table in this style, it could be worth as much as a quarter of a million pounds. So has Frank been storing a small fortune? In today's market, you're looking probably for sale 250, maximum 350. Yeah. That's what you would expect. Mm -hmm. And that's something probably that you would get from, a, from an auction room. I think it'd be very hard to go to the dealers because they have to be very, very selective on what they actually buy. I think we both agree it's uh, a nice table. Yes, it's reproduction, but uh, are you interested in buying it? Um, if it was a period one, very much so. But Frank, as it's basically a copy, I'm not interested. I mean, I have to be very, very selective on the pieces of furniture I do buy now because I have a very selected client who comes in looking for the period pieces. If it's, say, 15 years ago, yes, I would have bought it off you because I know I would have been able to sell it on today's market. No, I can't. I wouldn't be able mm. to. Mm. I'm not surprised you was not buying it because this one, 1930s furniture is very out of fashion yeah. and we're not too late to get it into auction, yeah. the, in, in the local auction room, and we put it in there, but realistically, it's got a game with an estimate of 80 to 120 pounds. We'll sell it, as Hubert says, not as a dining table. Yeah. We're gonna change the terminology to a centre table. Centre which table, should, absolutely. Yeah. Which is what it really is, yeah. and hopefully someone with a big house is looking for a good table and, mm. um, and a bargain. Some sound advice from Tom. Victoria and I have talked about it before and said, probably because of its condition or whatever, or style. And the demand in terms of the market these days, the best place probably would be auction. And it's turned out, on expert advice, that probably is the best way. The table hasn't sold to the specialist, but it still stands a chance at auction. And that's where we've now come to see the rest of Frank's hoard go under the hammer. So, Frank and Victoria, any ideas what you might make today if you sell everything? Not a, not a, not a clue. I mean, no expectations. Everything that comes, I'm grateful. Excellent. So, Victoria, what are your thoughts on the money? Um, I don't know. We'd be lucky if we get anything, actually. But I think um, it'd be nice if we got sort of between one and two hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Before the auction begins, there's just time to hear auctioneer Matthew Caddick's take on Frank's lots. I think the main thing about Frank's items are that they're priced fairly moderately, um, ranging from the modern tiny Chinese reproductions through to um, the teak steps and so on. They're all fairly moderately priced, so I think just basically on price point he'll do fairly well today. There's a set of nesting tables, again, modern, Chinese-inspired. Um, they ought to do well. Nesting tables always seem to do well, and they're a very, very low estimate. So uh, both on attractiveness and price, I think they ought to surprise him today. Time for the guessing to end and the bidding to begin. Lot number 10A now. Here we are, Frank. Okay, later, Frank. Pay attention, and coming up turn. next. First up, the library steps valued by Tom at 80 to 120 pounds. It's done me 50 pounds for these steps. £40 for them, not a hand moves. £30 for them, £30 on bid, 32 35 and 40 And 40 42 45 48 and £50. At £48 here, still no money at £48, take £50 now. At £48 only, are we all done? And selling at £48, that's disappointing. Only £48, but at least that's a step in the right direction. It's followed by the collection of China with an estimate of 40 to 50 pounds. 20 pounds, then we'll see where it goes. Lot for the money at 20 pounds, start me. 20 pounds on bid and two I'll take. It's half price only at 20 pounds, take two now. No one else wants to come in then at 20 pounds and made and bid, is it? 22 in front of you, 25, sir. Oh, good. Somebody's bad. Thank God for that. At 28 pounds, the ladies bid, take 30 now at 28 pounds. Is that it? Are we done? At 28 pounds and selling. 
OK, 28. Oh, they got a bargain there. <laughs> a bargain indeed, but it's all pennies in the pot for Frank. The ornamental screen has also sold at £13. Next is a set of tables valued at 40 to 50 pounds. I'm bid at 55 pounds, I'll take 60 in the room. 60's there, 65, 70. You'll bid at 70 pounds, I'll take 80 now at 70 pounds, take five if it helps. At 70 pounds, take five now at 70 pounds. Are we all done out at 70 pounds? I think we are. 70 pounds. 70 pounds, brilliant. 70 pounds. Well, that's great news. It's sold at 20 pounds more than the estimate. Now the pounds are stacking up. Will the hibachi coffee table follow suit? I'm bid at thirty pounds. I'll take two in the room. Thirty pounds, take two. At thirty pounds, take two now. Thirty pounds. Five pounds for it. <laughs> no one else wants to come in. It's a dirt cheap coffee table. At thirty pounds, take two. Thirty-two beats my commission bid by two quid, and I'll take five now. At thirty-two pounds in front of me, no further bids on thirty-two pounds. We done. Only thirty-two pounds, but at least it's sold. It's followed by the reproduction Ming sideboard with an estimate of £100. Just me £100 for it. The sideboard, £100 for it. £50 for it. Okay. Nobody's bidding. Is anyone bidding? £30 for it. £30 I'm bidding two now. I'll take it. £30, take two. At £30 only. It's ridiculously cheap. At £30, take two. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> Victoria. No further competition. I'm going to have to sell it to you at £30 then. Oh, we're on a roll now. Yes. We're on a roll, Frank. Frank's doing OK. His Hong Kong hoard is selling, but what about the final item, that William and Mary centrepiece, which our specialist Hubert declined? Will our bidders be tempted? Sell me £50 for it. Good useful table, £50 for it, £30 for it. All right, let's start at £10 and see where it goes. Don't listen to this. It's not even worth £10. Shall I pass the lot? No bids of £10. No one wants to bid me £10. I'm forced to pass it there. No bids of £10. Oh, dear. Um, well, I'm amazed. Not even a tenner. What did you think of that experience? Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy oh, it? it was quite interesting. And I think to myself, what am I going to do next week? It'll be so boring. Oh, it won't be boring. I'll have to start collecting bits no, and pieces. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorting out a whole load of more That's stuff. Right, yeah. <laughs> Frank has sold six items at auction, including the nest of tables for £70 and the hibachi coffee table for £32. And he also sold the Chinese-style pillow to the specialist for a further £15. So after commission, that makes a grand total of £218. If he's able to get rid of the other items in storage, he'll save himself over £3,000 a year. But what about the William & Mary table, which didn't sell at the specialist or auction? It's been all around the world, and what's going to happen to it? We've got to decide <laughs> how to dispose of it. Well, it's how? not following me home, I can tell you that now. <laughs> Is it following you home? No. No, it's not going well, to haunt you well, anymore. I think some charity or other. Yes. Uh, they can make best use of this. Yes. Even if they only display China on it. <laughs> yes, actually, that's a point. Frank, with his daughter Victoria, has done a great job dealing with the memories of his time in Hong Kong with Eileen, and it's been a chance to come to terms with a 27-year-old worry. If he keeps going, hopefully he'll get back some of the nearly £50,000 it's cost him over the years. Coming up, has Daniel been framed? Have you seen anything you like? Um, it's got that look on his face. As his hoard goes under the hammer. I'll take 50 in the room. At 48 pounds, he'll be take 50 now. Earlier on Storage Hoarders, we met war veteran Frank and his daughter Victoria. Frank has spent nearly 50,000 pounds on storage since he and his family returned from living in Hong Kong 27 years ago. Frank managed to make over 200 pounds at auction. It's a small step, but he's well on the way to ditching his storage habit. Now it's time to catch up with Daniel and his friend Alistair, who've been sorting through Daniel's pile of a thousand prints, currently being stored to the tune of £1,300 a year. I've asked antiques expert Tom Keane to take a private view. With 20 years experience in the collectibles trade, Tom is a practised hand at sorting the trash from the treasure. So, Tom, have you and seen anything you like? Um, it's got that look on his face. I look on my face. And the trouble is, because you bought a job lot, you bought a right mixture across the board. Some 
very invaluable, yep. almost uh, giveaway jobs, worth the frame of the glass. There's some value there. And some other things that aren't going to be too bad, but uh, you're not going to be able to retire. OK. Not yet, anyway. He's well, only young. <laughs> well, that's fair enough, then. Anyway. Right, we'll start with the good news first. Now, these screen prints on canvas... Yep. Are still quite desirable, not particularly valuable, but this is a pre Raphaelite image and uh, that's worth 25 30 pounds. Okay, now these are always good news, yeah, always good news. That these Gustav Klimt yep. prints now I've sold those, not get excited, 80 to 150 pounds. So if they went to auction, you end up putting an estimate of 40 or 50 pounds yep. on them, you should be all right. The real thing's 10 million. Have one of these for 100 quid, yeah, yeah, it's a bargain, but you've got quite a few, haven't you? I have, yep, so we're probably. Uh... Probably best part of a dozen of the sort of Gustav Klimt's from sort of the lovers and the kiss. Yep. So, okay. but you need not to flood the market, you've got to do them piecemeal. Piece, piece, piece. Okay. Otherwise you're going to do yourself in. Well, I always knew Tom had an eye for spotting a gem, and he's even found a stray bucket that Daniel forgot was tucked away among the hoard of prints. Well, I know this is a little bucket of uh, china here. Have you been through this? I only had a quick skim for off. I went through this earlier on. You've got five Neo figures. They're the poorer brother to Ladro, but not far behind them. You've got five of those. I checked them, there's no damage. Mm. They could do with a wash, though. OK. Mm. But Aggie will advise you on the cleaning. She can do, indeed. <laughs> Soapy washer. <laughs> Put an estimate of 45 to 65 on those. Well, that's a stroke of luck. With Alistair's help, Daniel has done a good job of getting his head round what he's actually got among his 1,000 prints. Included in the items going to auction, the pre-Raphaelite print at 25 to 30 pounds, and the popular Gustav Klimt print at 40 to 50 pounds. Also going to auction is the collection of nail porcelain figures, which Tom has valued at 45 to 65 pounds. Among the hoard, Tom found some rather interesting advertising prints which he thinks would benefit from closer inspection and has recommended taking them to Lawrence Roper, who has been supplying prints and posters to the connoisseurs of Birmingham for the past eight years. I want to show you this. There you are. A 1930s, uh, obviously, Chicago print. What, what can you tell us about that? Anything? A lot of the sort of what we would call retro posters are very popular at the moment. Um, I think perhaps with the recession, people are spending a bit more money on home, collecting posters. Um, a lot of the older posters are lovely because they're all hand illustrated. It's sort of not the modern age of computer graphics. It's things that were actually painted by hand. So they have that lovely quality about them. Let's have a look at the, uh, the screen prints. Now, this is a different sort of production method, isn't it, for this... Uh, Advertising print. Yeah, yeah. These old uh, old adverts again are great. Um, again, talking about the illustration earlier, you know, it's things that are done by hand. Um, uh, and also, I think that sometimes the old holiday destination things like that, when people have travelled. And again, I think it's the, the sort of the way these were produced. It was all hand illustrated, so they just make nice nice pictures. Buying prints can be a real investment, but it's important to distinguish between original period prints and contemporary reproductions. Then there's also limited edition artist prints, which are artworks in themselves. What do you think about this uh, one we left? I have to do the honours for us. <laughs> there it is. A bit later in style, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, and it's nice, you know, again, talking about the, the sort of hand illustrations. Um, I'm not sure some of these might have originally have been screen printers to get these lovely, fat, bold colours. Um, there's a resurgence now within art prints that a lot of artists do screen printing because it's more of a hand-on um, sort of craft technique as opposed to sort of pushing a button and mm -hmm. pressing go. So, Lawrence, um, I suppose we'd better cut to the chase here. Um, would you be interested in buying these? Yeah, I'd say this is... Um, we've, we've stock uh, similar work, so, yeah, I would. Individually, I'd probably say about £20 each, but there's all three. Maybe if you can get me down for sort of a tenner each, something like that. Well, hang on, hang on. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> go go on. On. 10 to 20 to 20. So I'm looking at three twenty sixty. We'd probably be having a deal at 50 quid. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah so maybe, so. maybe 50. I'll never move my lips. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. 50 quid. Is it 50? Oh, Is it 50? Yeah. Yeah. You happy with that, Alistair? You didn't get a chance to get a word in his way. No, so he's, I, got, he's, yeah. he's had that sort of 50 quid. I think the deal's <laughs> there. I think it's done. I think it's good, yeah. Daniel's quite a sharp operator once he gets going. And Tom's advice here has paid off. Knowing where to sell your items is so important. 
targeting a dealer in this niche market has clearly paid dividends for Daniel. I think the valuation was, you know, was, was, was a fair assessment. Um, I've got the money. Um, I'm happy. Um, so I made a profit there. Uh, off to auction as well next. So let's, um, let's hopefully we'll see this start to multiply a bit. Next stop in his journey of discovery into the art market is the auction room. It's time for Daniel to discover how much cash can be clawed back as his items go under the hammer. So Daniel, here we are at auction. How are you feeling? A little bit nervous, a little bit of trepidation, um, and hopefully, um, but hopefully going to be a good day though. Excited? I am excited. Um, I always, always get a little bit excited when there's money involved. I see you have reserves on everything. You sure about those reserves? You don't want to take them down a little bit. Should we just get rid of them? Oh, yeah, let's be radical. Let's be a bit Fantastic. wild. Oh, I like that. <laughs> so, um, now you have no reserves on anything, yep. assuming they'll all go, any idea up there? I'd probably like, after deductions, to walk away with a couple of hundred quid today, would be nice. Mm. Yeah, if we make a few quid today and get 200 quid, I'll, I might treat the wife to a burger meal tonight. Oh, it's generosity itself, <laughs> isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> With the auction about to begin, there's just time to see what auctioneer Matthew Caddick thinks of today's lots. OK, so Daniel has given us a mixture of porcelain and artwork, and there are some famous names in amongst it. I would say things like the Gustav Klimt, although they're prints, the prices should get them sold, and they should exceed estimate today. Um, they're good decorative reproductions that we see fairly regularly, and they always, always impress. In fact, Daniel's had second thoughts and is keeping the £50 reserve on this item. In addition, the now figures, now a subsidiary of the uh, the famous Ladro factory, the Spanish porcelain, whilst they will, will sell, they will sell at a price. Let the bidding begin. OK, you're up next. Ready for this? Broad shoulders. Excited? I am. Good. <laughs> Are you keeping your notes for the money you're going to make? Oh, yes. <laughs> Every <Good. sighs> First up is the pre-Raphaelite print with an estimate of 25 to 30 pounds. Stop me £20 for it, £20 for it, £10 for it, £5 for it, £10 for it. £5 I'm bidding six is next. It's no money at £5, someone give me six. At £5, to my left then. Oh dear, not such a great start, is it? The first print sold, but for only £5. Hopefully the Neo China may prove a bit of a bonus. Daniel's unsure, but Tom valued it at £45 to £65. Stop me £40 for them, £40 for them, £30 for them. A hand's going to go up at 20 isn't it? £20 start me. The now figures £20, £10, £10 there, £12, £15, £18, £20, £22, £25, £30, £40, £50, £60, £70, £80, £90, £100, £200, £300, £300, £400, Come on, it was getting exciting. At £28, I'm bid take £30 now. £28 standing in the cap at £28, all done. The porcelain is sold for £28 below the estimate of 45 to 65 pounds, but not bad for something that had been hiding away in a bucket. Finally, we've got high hopes for the Klimt print, which Tom valued at 40 to 50 pounds. However, this is the one item that Daniel decided to keep a reserve on. I'll take 50 in the room. At 48 pounds, here me take 50 now. It's looking a bit better. No one else wants to come in then at 48 pounds. It's not quite enough then at 48 pounds. We're gonna pass this one. Perhaps he should have lifted that £50 reserve after all. So, Daniel, are you slightly disappointed there? A little bit. I mean, you know, there's some education required in London, so they know the Picassos from the Bacons. Um, but what can we do? Right, well, we did, we, joint decision, did agree to get rid of the reserves. Um, do you think that was still a good decision? Well, I'm a good Irishman, I'm a good gambling man, so you've got to take a gamble in life. Mm -hmm. You never know. No regrets there? No. After commission, Daniel made £79 at auction. He sold the advertising prints for £50 and then sold some more prints to the gallery for £60. That's a total of £189. It's not much, but it's a start, and if he clears the storage unit, he'll save another £1,300 a year. Thing is, on average, you paid £3 each, so... Still in profit. Still in profit, think of it like that. The Clint print, that came sort of within two pounds of the lower reserve, of your reserve. Um, were you a bit kind of like, mm, they can have it for that, or 
Yes. Have you done anything about yeah. that? I'm hoping to have a little chat with the auctioneer afterwards and just see if we can either pop it back in um, or take the commission bid. So are you feeling optimistic about getting rid of all the rest of them? I'd like to, yeah, get it sorted in the next couple of months now. We need to get out there into those more specialist markets. Yes. The people who are sort of wheeling and dealing in this on a daily basis. Yes. We'll do it. Is he deluded or do you think he actually will? Sometimes he's deluded. I think on this occasion, yes, he's deluded. <laughs> <laughs> As long as Daniel keeps going and clears his unit at an average of more than £3 a pick, this wheeler dealer should be able to recoup his initial outlay and be well on the way to fulfilling his dream of saving for his six-month-old son's education. Both hoarders today have dealt with their demons, downsized their units and freed up some storage space for more sensible use. Join me, Aggie McKenzie, next time on Storage Hoarders. Thank you.